Ready is relentless. Ready is fearless. Ready is fearing no foe. Ready for the next level? Renew your season ticket now and support Rangers into season 2021. Prices are frozen for next season and the renewals deadline is extended. Visit rangers.co.uk slash renew to secure your season ticket today. Always Rangers. Always loyal. Hello everyone, welcome to the Four Lands of the Dream podcast. My name is Stephen Clifford and thanks for joining us for another edition. Joining us today is also our regular host, Mr Chris Jack. Chris, how are you? Very good, Stevie. Thanks for having us on once again. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's another great guest. We're looking forward to hearing from them. So it's a very warm welcome to our guest, Mr Morris Ross on the Four Lads Had a Dream podcast. Morris, how are you? I'm fine, uh, considering. Um, the weather's been good in the last week, so I've got much gardening done and whatnot, so it's... Listen, it's, it's, it is what it is. You've got to just get your head around it and, and you know, carry on and, and try and be as positive as you can. Same as everybody else, I guess. How difficult has um, this situation been for you um, as the, the Motherwell Reserve Manager? How are you keeping on top of your, your players' fitness and how are you keeping in touch with them and things? My, my position's kind of changed in the last six months at Motherwell. I'm, I'm actually the first team coach now um, and I basically have a... <clears throat> an oversight of the of the of the younger lads without having a day to day, yeah, involvement with them. Um, that's Demi Carroll's position now. From that, then um, we'll kind of we'll, we'll journey back and is we'll, we'll kind of talk through wee bits of your career. But something that we'd spoke about before you'd done this is that you've done obviously um, open goal and things like that. So we're going to try and ask you some slightly different questions. So I hope that people will enjoy that as we go through it. One of the first things I was going to say to you was um, about your your kind of your start in football and who were your er- early career heroes and early inspirations in football that that um, inspired you to get involved. Do you know what? I never really, I never really got me inspired by by a certain individual. It was more by chance that I ended up uh, playing football. You know, nine, ten year old, whatever it was. Um, once I started realising that, you know, I was I was involved with, with Dundee United and whatnot. Um, then you start thinking, maybe oh, this, maybe this could be something, you know. But it's not. It's, it was more by chance than by design. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would have to say, my, my early, my early heroes, um, being a Dundee United fan when I was a kid, uh, was Morris Malpass. That was that was a guy I always thought oh, he's just the best, you know. Uh, I was a defender, or a, a kind of fullback type, um, and I always kind of looked up to him. Um, it wasn't until later where you start, <clears throat> you start getting in contact with, with the clubs like Rangers and you start being about Ibrox, you start to get to go and collect the balls for the first team when you're, when you're on your work experience, etc. That you, you start seeing how good these top players are. Um, and then I, I kind of always looked up to John Brown, Richard Goff type, Richard Goff types. <clears throat> you know, I, I never looked up to the Durantes and whatnot, no, but because I just knew that I would never get to that level with their, with their level of ability. So I try to focus on the more Robotic, the more uh, training product type players like Bomber and, and Richard Goff. So, as I would love to come on and say it was an exciting Brian Ludrup thing, but it wasn't. It was yeah, dull footballers at the back that I, that I looked up to the most. You've talked a lot about your early experiences with John Brown and how much of a guidance he was in terms of helping you um, focus and kind of block out and. It, kind of focused on your own characteristics and mentality and things like that. Has that helped you in the role and, and in the previous roles? Has that helped you? And do you use a lot of that experience yourself going forward? What, Bom- what, what Bomber was magnificent at was, was taking a, a young, frail, well, not so much frail, but a, a young kind of wet behind the ears boy that, you know, coming from school into being a young man and, and potentially a young man with, with an attitude and application that would make him into a first team player. And what I admire about that process or that style that Bomber had that is absolutely vacant in all academies up and down the country, and I mean not all but majority, is the ability to cut through nonsense and tell you how it is at the risk of upsetting you for a day or a half, you know, by telling you 
that's not good enough by any matter of means. You have got to do X, Y, and Z before you're even considered about going into the twenties team. Never mind the first team. And it was a level of honesty and a level of transparency that you knew where you you, you knew where you stood. If you didn't work hard enough, you were told. If your passing wasn't up to scratch, you were told. And what I feel now is that there's a there's a softness, there's a there's a sterile environment in these academies where you're not allowed to upset anyone, you're not allowed to offend anyone, you're not allowed to raise your voice, you're not allowed to. You know, to make somebody feel bad, and I mean, what is that creating? Now, I use this analogy all the time. If you're going on holiday to, to Egypt or whatever, right, you know, you, you're, and you know, where there's typhoid, etc. What does, when you go to the doctors, they provide you, they, they give you a dose of typhoid to build up some resistance to that disease. Now, in these academies, they're not getting these, these hardships, these obstacles, these speed bumps, whatever you want to call it. So how can you then go from that sterile environment and walk around into the first team arena and not expect to be shouted at, not expect to be berated when you've, you've taken up the wrong position when you're no, or no match the runner? So what happens is these young lads go up there and it's a shell shock. And the majority of them, vast majority, are no, they're no emotional or ready for it because they've not been fed that from 16 to, to 19, 20 when they, when they should be ready for first team. And I think it's a testament to, to the good old days that, listen, we're, we're not talking about effing and blind and, and, and whatnot, but there's got to be some form of spectrum where you can, you can give somebody it when they need it. But then you cuddle on the, the next nine times. You know, there's got to be allowed that, and I don't see it enough in these high-profiled academies, and I, think it's, uh, and I think it shows. I think it shows there's, there's less and less boys coming through academies and making first teams. The ones that are making it are they're getting they're getting released at academy level and they're going to real men's football at League Two, League Three in England or wherever it is, and at League One. And they're thrown a deep end and they learn quickly and they're exposed to negative feedback. And before you know it, they find their feet and, and the talent that they had as a 16, 17 year old is now paired with a robust mentality that allows them to become a, a professional footballer. Because John Brown's best saying he ever said to me, if you can't handle me shouting at you, how can you handle 52,000 maniacs shouting at you? And for that day forward, I, I had a different approach. You tasted um, early success in the youth team when Rangers won the Reserve League. Hmm. Did that give you a, a, a kind of a basis and, and a taste for the hunger of wanting the, the top flight success and, and the first kind of major thing in, in your career that, that kind of kicked you on? Do you know, see, see, I always say, like, winning, winning, winning a football match is a byproduct of majority of your team making the right decisions and, you know, and, and having ability. Winning trophies, you know, that needs to go on for a prolonged period of time. But we never focused on winning trophies. We just focused on having a, a competitive, no-nonsense training culture where every single time you trained, you were timed. There was a, there was a result. There was a punishment. There was there was consequence, and so rather than focusing on, on on winning things per se, we just got our habits correct. We got our day to day correct. If you were late, there was punishment. If you never did your job correct, there was punishment. So there was consequence in everything you do. So when you go on Ibrox, you know if I make a bad pass, both you're going to lose a goal here. So that you're, you're you're indoctrinated into just being regimented and, and on time and doing things correct and intensity has got to be there, the fitness has got to be there. Don't do nine push-ups I've asked you to do ten. Do eleven. That was the kind of mantra that we had. So the, the whole thing about winning trophies, yeah, it was great to win a trophy. Of course it was, you know, and winning the BP Cup and the Glasgow Cup and all that stuff. But because you're indoctrinated for your 13-14, it's expected. So it's not like, okay, I've won the Reserve League, I want to win more. I wanted to win every single day in training. And you, Bomber and John McGregor used to set up head tennis competitions and whatnot. And you would see the ones that wanted it. And I do that now with my young boys when, when I take them the odd time. I'll, uh, I'll set up head tennis tournaments. And without fail, it's not the ones with the most talent. It's the, yeah, there are some that have got talent and will to win. But inevitably, the ones that are the best head tennis players are the ones that didn't give up. They're so competitive, they're combative, they're, they've got that ingrained in their DNA, that will to win. And, you know, and that's never left me. You know, I, I, maybe it was in me before, I don't know. 
Um, but it certainly was heightened when I went when I went to Ivox. It would be Dick Advoca that gave you your first taste of, of first team football, and in a time where Rangers were were blessed with you know a team full of internationalists, how did you um, find your voice in that dressing room? And was the grounding that Bomber had given you just vital to to everything that you said? They're vital to to getting into that first team and making sure that once you got there, you were there to stay. See, see the, the way it works, you don't just go from being a, an 18s player to a 20s player or reserves in the days to first team. You're, you're kind of drip fed for over a two, three year period. So like when you're 17, 18, sometimes you get to train the first team or you go on a pre-season friendly with the first team and you get 10 minutes or you play in a, a testimonial where there's four or five first team players. So, and you, and, and in the 80s as well, and you, you were, you ate with the first team. So, you were allowed in the dressing room with the first team. You, you were cleaning their boots. You were you were skivvies for the first team. So you were as much as you were a, a, a seventeen year old boy. They all knew your name. You, they would they would they would treat you. Yeah, yeah. You knew your place, but you you, you were I've been around Durante since I was fifteen year old. You know what I mean? So when by the time it comes to being <coughs> in around them and, and somewhat one of them, um, you're, you're kind of used to it and and. And the indoctrination, I keep going back to that indoctrination word that Bomber that instills in you. You actually believe, I'm meant to be here. I'm not here by mistake, I'm here by, you know, I've, I've earned this. And even if you then, you know, you go in there and you don't show up the same talent as a Jonas Tern or a Barry Ferguson, you've still got that steeliness, that willingness, that Rangers, I'm never say die kind of attitude that, even if somebody does go past you, you think, oh, that's not going to happen again. So then what happens? You start, you start honing skills like, okay, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be a bit more aggressive on this guy. I'm going to start booting him. I'm going to start grabbing him. I'm going to start getting tighter to him. You know, all these different things that you start actually enhancing your own game. And it's no based around taking a touch and making a 60-yard pass because not everybody can, can do that. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a drip-fed environment. But when you do then get your initials on your jersey, that first day at Murray Park when I got, I got told I was with the big boys and had MR on my top, I thought, okay, now the, now the, 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 hot, the honeymoon is over. Now it's in my job. I've got to, win. I've got to be part of a, a, a culture. I've got to be part of the link in the chain and of 11 bodies on, the, on Ibrox. That I've got to do my job. And it's daunting, it's frightening, but it's so exciting. It's, it's, it's the best period of my life uh, from a football sense. Rangers would quickly transition from Dick Advocate to Alex McLeish. How much of a um, transition was it for you on the training ground? And what did you learn um, in, in differences of, of style of man management from both? <clears throat> no, I've, 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 talk, I've been documented as saying this before, that the, the, the gaffer like Mr Advocat, he, was, he had £4 million players times 20. Everybody was an internationalist, every single player. And we're talking about top internationalists, not just you know a Welsh internationalist or a, a, a Georgian international, whatever. We're talking Dutch. We're talking <laughs> the best German internationalists. We're talking the best of the best. So it was it was mainly about keeping harmony, keeping discipline, and having a basic principle of five defend, five attack. And it was about having a structure behind an attack that wouldn't allow us to be counter-attacked. And that's very much the principles that I hold through today um, since I went to Motherwell. And that's followed me all my, all my career. The difference when the manager, the, the gaffer, Art McLeish, come in um, was, of course, it was a different style. Um, remember, people, people seem to forget is, um, the gaffer was, was young in his management career. So he was still... He was still cutting his teeth. I know he's been at Motherwell and Hibs, but he was quite a young man when he got that job. So, so he he'll even admit himself that he he was he was he was learning on the job as well. Whereas Dick Advocate was 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 a, basically a master of it, an oracle of football. Um, so the, the the differences were, were quite stark. Uh, the, the manager at McCoy was, was more personable and more more that kind of. Yeah, he, he kind of got closer to the players, whereas Mr. Abercat was, was was more distant. The tactical stuff, I, I felt Art McLeish had a more 
man management style versus uh, for, for the versus uh, Dick Advocate. Um, but he had to because if you look at the the players that we could then attract, they were still good players, but they weren't quite of the, the class that that uh, Dick Advocate was able, was was enabled to 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 bring into the club in, in terms of spending four, five, six million on players, twelve million in, in Toronto Foles instance. So it was it, was, it had to be different. Um, but what it does, it, it then injected a different style. It was a bit more robust. It was a bit more aggressive. It was a bit more, what you would say, I don't know, more defensive as such. So, listen, every, every manager you have has his strengths and weaknesses, and um, and they two were no different. Touching a wee bit on your getting on to actual um, points in your career and, and and highlights, and we've had obviously Alex McLeish come on, and we've had a lot of players and. We've spoken about the League Cup win in 2003, but we wanted to ask you from a different point of view. We know the stories about the wins and things like that, but you came on at around 65 minutes at a time in the game where Rangers were 2-1 were up and Peter Lovinkranz was playing in front of you. How difficult is it to come into such a massive game and, and what kind of instructions and formation and, and stuff like that do you get before going on? Because it must be, it must be in terms of, for you, it must be you know, to get up to speed and things like that. How quickly and how important is it that you get on and take all that information and, and get on there quickly? <clears throat> I, I actually think you have an advantage um, in a sense that you can see the pattern of the game from the side. So, you, so you're actually evaluating it, with, evaluating it without the the, the the kind of commotion all around, around about you, the emotion, the, the commotion, all these different things that are going on in your your head, people are winding you up, you've made a bad pass, you, you, the game can sometimes pass you by, but as a sub, which was often for me, um, you could, you, you get a picture of the game, and, and you know, people talk about Ole on a social coming off the bench and scoring all the time, because he's seen the patterns, he saw how the defenders were behaving, and he then adapted his mindset of game plan going into that to, to conquer his opponent. Me, I, I wasn't as sophisticated as that, but listen, when you're going to, I take it you're talking about the Scottish Cup, uh, the, the League Cup against Celtic. Yes, the the two one victory when Lovenkans and Kenny just scored. You came on sixty five minutes or so for bonus sale. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. left back got injured. Yeah, so you know I actually enjoy playing left back um, better than I did right back. I, I felt that you, the range of passing would be easier. You could come inside and, and switch play, and you could your passes back to the goalkeeper, for instance, would be safer because you were on your right side. So all these different things made it easier for me playing at left back um, but you know to, to get back to your point there's no real rhyme or reason sometimes you go on you play well sometimes you go on and, and you can't get into the game me as a full back it was more about when you have loving cans in front of you it's about okay pass it to him and support him because you're not really going to be able to run beyond Peter loving cans the speed he runs it so it was more about having I wasn't instructed to do anything it was just to have a kind of tactical awareness myself to say okay we're two one up. I can stay in shape. I can support Peter from behind and and just make sure we see this game out. So it wasn't a program movement from from the manager to, to put me in. It was more forced because Bonnie was injured, and then it was just about evaluating. And you know what's easy when you've got was it Amaruso and Craig Moore on the inside? Was it? I can't remember the team. It's that long ago. Um, but you know, talking yeah, it was it was Amo and Moore were at centre half. Yeah, so you, they're as the safe as houses. So it's yeah. It's um, yeah. It was it was actually I, I remember it quite quite vividly, like in terms of the actual playing part. No, and it was it was just good to to get to defeat Celtic again in a cup final. It was it's always nice. We're at that point where we're heading for a, a treble, um, and it's it's, it's obviously it's something I wanted to ask you as well. We've seen clips of you, Morris, um, since the Scottish Cup final was was on a couple of weeks ago and, and people have commented that they've seen a, a side to you perhaps that people didn't realise. It was one that I knew of at the time, but you were you were actually quite a hard player in terms of you would always, um, there, there was clips in the Scottish Cup final where you're shouting at your teammates and things like that. When we were heading for trebles like we were back in 2002-2003, were you a voice in the dressing room? Were you one of the ones that, that kind of brought through your upbringing from John Brown and, and would kind of go from there and, and kind of drive people on? <laughs> um, no, I, I, no, because it would, it would come across as forced, I, I would think, because my, my standing in the group wasn't oh, as one of the main players. It never was. So I was always 
playing like just just like a supporting role. Now, if at half time you come in and somebody had a go at me and they were wrong, then I would back back, of course. Um, but in terms of going out before a game, it was always your Barry's, Craig Moore, Stephen Kloss, Neil McCann, these guys that, that would be the more vocal. I was more of a supporter, but again, I, I would still stick up for myself. And, and, and if, I, if I believed I was correct, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just argue for arguing's sake. But no, it, it's important that you know your position within any group. You know, when, when you're at work, you know, there's a hierarchy. And, and, and in football team, it's, it's no different. It's when you try and, no, uh, we, we talk about it in Motherwell, stay in your lane, know your role, know what your position is, stay in your lane, you don't get bitten. You know, it's one of the ones where if you then start to try and be something you're not, you always get found out. So, no, to, to answer you, I, I was a supporting role. As, as, as strong-willed and as opinionated as I can be, but as soon as you go on that, over that white line, it's, you're in fight or flight mode. So if somebody's saying something to you you disagree with, of course, you're going to argue back. But, I mean, if you look at that cup final, Neil McCann and Barry Ferguson are arguing like mad. And Newman and Neil McCann were arguing like mad. They're, they're caught, on, uh, caught on video. But it's just to spur each other on. Because if you berate someone for making a mistake or not doing the right thing, you've then got to make sure that you're switched on and you're doing the right thing because they're going to come back at you. So it, it actually just creates a kind of an environment everybody just keeps each other on their toes. Sometimes it's, it's bravado, sometimes it's made up, sometimes it's to keep that person on his toes. I mean, Barry just barked at everybody, but I believe that was to keep himself alert. Um, and, and ultimately it worked. I suppose the reason why I asked that was because there's there's other clips of you. You, you you're you quite, um, you say like you, you obviously had a, a stand in and things like that, but the point I was trying to get at is you never ever shirked away you were never one that kind of hid it away. There's clips of you being grabbing Johan Mialbi by round the neck and a headlock and things like that. When the going get tough, you were there. Um, and, and that was the, the, the kind of point I was, was, was kind of getting at, that we could have counted on you knowing full well that you weren't going to shy away from anything. Can I tell you, if, if it was me and Johan Mialbi in a room on my own, I'd have run out of that bloody room, I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at it, what? I've picked on the wrong one there, haven't I? Um, Christ, he's probably got 15 kilos on me. I said, you're at fever pitch. And I keep saying it's fight or flight. You are in the cauldron of Celtic Park. You've got 7,000 bears behind you. There's that siege mentality. Us against them. You know, you're not going to get any decisions for the ref. All that kind of siege mentality stuff that you have. And you know what? You, you don't even realise you're doing it. You don't even recognise it until, you know, later on your mates mention it or whatever. Um, but you know what? It's part, it's part of... The spectacle, it's part of the, the whole beauty of the old forum. Um, and I just I'm so so grateful that I've, I've, I've been part of it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a special place in my heart, it's made me the man I am today, and hopefully, it's, it's going to stand me in good stead in my coaching career because it's, I've got nothing but fond memories from, from the whole journey from 12, 13 year old to, to leaving when I was 25. As uh, Stevie was saying there, Morris, we've had a uh, big echo on uh, just a couple of weeks ago and he was talking through uh, the uh, title win over uh, Dundee, uh, over Ed, Ed and Fernland, sorry, uh, and or Stevie spoke about the game and everything that went, went with that game. From your perspective, in, in the game, build up to that game, you look at the, the characters and the guys in that dressing room, how how was the, okay, Nicky talk us through the game, build up to that one and uh, the, the game training through it and what a big echo was saying to you throughout that week? <coughs> The approach never really changed much. I mean, of, of course, we're, we're, there's nerves, but there's all these players are they're, they're made they're made that way. They're, they're kind of used to it because listen, see whether you're going at Ibrox in the first day of the season or the final day of the season is daunting. From pulling up to the school, parking your car, running the gauntlet across the street to facing so many hundreds of fans to to sign your autographs, etc. The whole build up is there every single day. It's like a cup final every day at Ibrox. It's that party atmosphere all the time. Um, and it's so daunting to, to run it in front of 52,000 and know that a bad touch or whatever is, is going to be spotted. So it doesn't really change. Um, and I always remember the, ma the manager's approach on the Dunfermline game, it was, it was more about being calm, trust yourselves. You know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a one of these ones where you need to rally the troops, so to speak, because everybody knew the importance. So it was. Um, it, it never really, it never really altered because every week was a must win anyway. So we programmed in that. So it doesn't change. Um, 
you know, I was looking at the, I looked at the game, looked at the game back a couple of weeks ago. It was on, but the stark difference for me was looking at the, the quality, the standard of the, of the. If you look at going back from Rugby Park to Ibrox, Rugby Park to Ibrox, the, the level of football Rangers were playing in the days was sensational compared to to what Celtic. But you know, look at everything. Everything went in the box. Everything was long from from, from Celtic's point of view, um, and we were. Which looked like we were popping it everywhere, the, the, passing through the midfield, through the through the back in the midfield, through the through the thirds, and it just looked like a total different brand of football. Um, now, certainly, we're a ph- phenomenal football team as well. There's no getting away from that. But I just, I, I was like, wow, look at the difference. And looking at that difference, I'm saying, well, you know, we we did deserve to win that title. You also deserve to win the uh, Scottish Cup that season as well. That Oscar runs off the the treble. The did indeed game at hand and you come on at, at half time a, a sub for Michael Moles. Mm-hmm. What was the what was uh, Alex thinking behind behind that switch? Not the most natural of, of switches, but what was the kind of the key tactical switch that he made us a big arm finally gets the goal and all ends well? But what was kind of going through your mind at half time when he says, right, now no, you're going on and uh, Michael's coming off? I think it was more to get numerical advantage in the middle of the part. I think we, to get Rickson in the middle of the part for his legs. Um, so I, th- I would imagine they've take, put me on, put, taken Moles off, and they've re- readjusted the front three where I've allowed De Boer and McCann. I think that would be, would it be McCann? No. Yes, I was. I was uh, Neil Shot and uh, Michael that started. Yeah, so they've taken Moles off and they've put they've take, put De Boer up front. That's what we've done. Mm-hmm. And so I think you've given a wee bit more energy in the middle of the park. With, with Fernando and of course my, my physical uh, abilities in the wider areas um, but remember Dundee were on top at that point Dundee were actually putting us under the pump so I think getting a wee bit of fresh legs at, at the back um, and, and beefing it up with Fernando in the middle of the park uh, I think we, we weathered the storm then and you know luckily for, for ourselves that Big Amo put his head bravely put his head on, on a, I think it was a Neil McCann cross and, and we got the win so it was it's not it's not a classic sub Ross for for Moles, but I think I think that was the thinking behind it. That that game also proves to be the final one for a lot of that squad, and there's a big change over over that summer. Going into o three o four, obviously, in the end, doesn't turn out to be as a successful a season. How did you feel the kind of dynamic changing when we look at some of the guys that left, and with all respect, the guys that came in, not quite of a similar pedigree, not quite a similar standard. Alex Ross having to do a bit of wheeling and dealing in the transfer market. How, how was the squad at that time? And did you feel yourself that the guys we've got are just really not as good as what we've had uh, previously? I think that the, the, it's, it's twofold. I think if you look at the leagues we've won, they were, they were won on the last day. So as much as Celtic, as much as we could say, yeah, we won this, we won that, Celtic could easily feel the, felt aggrieved that they'd lost the titles. So it was very, very, very fine. So to to then go on in two thousand three, two thousand four, and, and lose the title, it's 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 no disgrace considering how how strong Celtic were. Um, I always felt it was. I wouldn't say the type of cards because the characters were decent guys and whatnot, but I always felt there was a lack of mobility in some of the players we signed. Um, I don't want to name names, but a lack of mobility for sure. <clears throat> you know, and under uh, the Capricats regime and in Alex first year, um, there was there was there was a dynamic uh, feeling to Rangers. Yes, of course, you had your De Boers who weren't the lightning quick, but they were so clever, so technical, so so smart that they they, they, could, they could influence football matches standing on their heads as long as they had willing runners. You know, you had Kenny, you had McCann, you had Lovenkans. There was always pace there. Mikey Moles was explosive. Rod Wallace was in there under the the Advocate era. So there was always a bit of explosion in, in, in the forward areas. Um, and even in midfield areas when Rickson and Barry, you know, you had legs everywhere. So I felt that that was maybe something we, we start signing players that were aged or ageing rather than going and signing 23, 24-year-olds that were on the up. And that's something that I, I talk about with, with our manager and, and coaching staff at Motherwell is we should always aim to sign players where their trend is up. Uh, and and, and the, my, the perfect example of, of this is, is myself starting at Rangers and ending up playing in in, uh, in China. You know, the trend is down. You go Rangers, Wolves, Vikings, Devanga, Turkish Super League, China. You know, the trend is not a positive trend. So now when I'm looking at players, I want 
boys that are on the up, boys that want to come to you and leave you. But in a positive sense, they want to come do great and earn the right to, to go and play at a higher level. I think that's so important because too many people, oh, he's got a great CV, yeah, but look at the trend. The trend is downwards. So I felt we signed players of that ilk um, in the days, which was ultimately our downfall. That squad also has a, a Champions League campaign to, uh, to go in. Uh, also Copenhagen, Stuttgart, Path and Icos, my United in that, in that group stage. For, for you, how, how did you feel okay, physically and mentally ready for that, for that Champions League challenge? Well, we even even though your, your squad maybe is not as strong as the one before, you, you're still you're still training well, you're still preparing well, still professional, still good footballers there. You know, you still got Avaladzis and Tetas and all these boys. It's still a good level, um, and 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 you're always you're always programmed to believe we will win this football match. So that doesn't change. The only, the only thing it changes is when you get that half chance can you score it the person that has that half chance does he have that talent to put it in the net rather than, than putting it past the post these are the fine margins that football matches are won on because when you're playing Copenhagen you know we win by a last minute short of a Lazio goal or last 10 minutes or whatever you know if that goes over the bar you know you're in a sticky situation again so it's it's, it's fine fine margins but we try to make sense of everything sometimes it's just good luck sometimes it's a bounce of a ball because at Champions League level they're all good teams they're all good footballers so it's, a, it's a difficult to, to actually draw a line around and say that's the reason or this is the reason. It's, it's really difficult. Um, and that's why you've got football talk shows that are on three, you know, three different talk shows on every night of the week because everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got selling certainty when actually there's, there's no certainty in football. Something I've, I've spoken to Big Egg about before was how he managed to set the team up you know, on, on a Saturday. The, the expectation is Rangers go and play in the front foot and they win games domestically, you then go and you go to Path Icos, you're maybe not expected to get anything, you go to Old Trafford, you're also right up against it. How, how does that differ for a player's approach and, and mentality going from, this is a, a, a domestic game, we're expected to go and uh, be on the front foot all the time, going into a European game, I think, well, for 75% of this game, we might be on the back foot here, it's a, it's a completely different approach, I'm assuming. Yeah, it, it is. But then again, you, you, You've got to understand that when, 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 when you're at a level of being a Rangers first team player, you've got certain characteristics, you've got a certain makeup, and one of, one, of, one of these traits or characteristics is loyalty to the system. You've got to be loyal to what your teammates demand of you, what the manager wants implemented. So when you're told that you're going to sit in a 4 5 1, narrow and compact the way to Man United, then that's what you're told, that's what you do. So it's, it's, it's about being professional and doing what you're told. Um, very, very few players can act in, uh, you know, as a maverick and, and, and roguelike and be successful. Very, very few. So, you know, when we're... I, I, I always remember, for some reason, it sticks in my mind, we went to plan for Nikos away and we never really worked on any shape. And I found that kind of strange that it was such a kind of big game. I don't know why whenever, whether it was to just relax us, to go, just go and play, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Maybe the manager felt that we were as good as them technically and that we can just go and beat them by, by the technical ability. But then I think we came and we played Dunf It was either Dunfermline the week before or Dunfermline the week after the Panthenaikos game and we did shape. I kind of felt that was kind of the, 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 the odd way around. I felt we should have been preparing the shape for, for the for the Plant and Icos game and, and maybe no need to not being disrespectful to Newfoundland but you would expect Rangers to have enough talent in the forward areas and midfield areas to, to go and, and put Dunfermline to the sword without you know specific tactical shape. So yeah that was one that, uh, that was only it's the only scenario that I remember that I felt I, I didn't quite understand that. Um, but again, you know, like I said it's there's there's rhyme or reasons but when you're a player you, you don't know what actually happens inside the coach's room. And the only reason I know that is now that I'm privy to these conversations. So it's it's a one thing we try to do is we try and sell sell a story to the players on a Monday, and hopefully it comes to fruition on a Saturday. So it's about making players believe what you're doing is correct, um, and that's half the battle. Well, so again, at the end of that season, there's another okay, fairly major uh, rebuild. Alec like, goes back into the transfer market again, and there's a lot of big names, a lot of big guys, influential guys that come in. The first bit of silverware, you play a big hand in it by getting the first goal and the. Uh, the uh, cup one over over a model, not very renowned for your, uh, your goal scoring ability, but what does it mean for, for you to get one on that day and also so much around the final? Uh, 
uh, David Cooper final and just how much it meant to the as a Rangers squad to, you know, to be back winning again after a, a barren year before? <clears throat> yeah, from from a from an individual point of view, you know, I, I never went into a game thinking I would ever score. Um, I was just delighted to to be starting in the cup final again. I, I think it was my, my third cup final, um, and just to you know that whole week build up to the game, waking up in the hotel, getting your suit on, getting the rose put in your put in your suit jacket. It's always a sunny day, you know that nice feeling of, of being at Hamden. Rangers have filled out the end that they've been given to then score. It's, it's kind of it's kind of surreal, you know. Uh, these boys that score every week, it's probably easy for them, but me scoring there was yeah, it's a it's a bit of a special moment for me. Um, but just see see the feeling you get when just winning a trophy. It's like joy and relief on one moment. You think, oh, that's us. We've won another trophy. Great. That keeps the wheels away from the door for another three months when there's another cup final. You know, that's kind of that's kind of how it feels. Um, but to, listen, you brought to Rangers to win trophies. Simple as that. If you're not winning trophies at Rangers, sorry, it's not happening. It's and unfortunately, this is the this is kind of the stage we're at for the last few years. It, it's, it's it's a tough scenario. Um, but ultimately, you're judged on that, and rightly or wrongly, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Did you win a trophy? No. Nope. Okay, substandard, and it and it's it's just, it's it's the only other league in the world that, that compares to this, in my opinion, is the is the Spanish league. Barcelona, Real Madrid, that's it. Rangers, Celtic, that's it. And it's 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 hard, it's tough. Um, it's fine, fine margins whether you win or, or lose, um, but ultimately you're judged on on trophies. And as fickle as it is, that's how it is. And you've got to you live your life and and and. And, and, and do your very, very best. And sometimes your best isn't enough. And that's the, that's, that's the hardship. Normally when you work hard and, and you have talent, etc., you, you, you can have success. But at Rangers and Celtic, typically the, the, the clubs are very so evenly matched. It's, it's on a knife edge. It's, it's a tough, tough environment to be involved in. Just a couple of weeks after that uh, cup final win, you're 2-0 down to Celtic. Petrov and Bellamy have scored. A big it takes off at half-time. Did you... Sit and watch that second half, thinking, "No, we've lost the league here. There's, there's no way back for us." The history paints a very different, a uh, different story. But how, how were you feeling for that uh, second forty-five minutes? Must be a fairly, a fairly depressing uh, feeling for you. I was, do you know what I? I remember the games, and you know, I've, I've had many, many, many a poor game and whatnot for for Rangers. But that game, I was actually <coughs> playing really well, and I remember it crystal clear. And this is a story I've, I've not told anyone before. We, we used to have these Powerade bottles, the kind of 500ml blue bottles, and I hadn't opened it yet, so there was still kind of, it hadn't deflated yet, so there was still some bounce in it, if you know what I mean, with the pressure. And uh, the manager came in and, and said to me, right, Morris, you're coming off. And I just, but, so I was sitting directly opposite Barry next to the pillar on, on the right-hand side of, of the, 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 the home dressing room, and I've bounced it off the floor in frustration or anger. It bounces, hits the roof, smashes and lands behind Barry Ferguson with all this bloody liquid and the manager comes at me and makes me <laughs> sit back down quite quick um, and and he, and he basically told me in no uncertain terms that it was effing tactical and with his big imposing figure I was quick to sit down again um, so I was initially frustrated but after the game you know it was, it was made quite clearly to me it was, it was a tactical decision and um, yeah, but he also, in that same note, uh, the doctor at the time, Ian McGuinness, um, came to me and said that the manager was actually happy with my response, even though at the time he, he had to kind of put me in my place. He, he was happy with that, that I didn't want to to, to, to miss out on, on playing against Celtic Ibrox in such an important fixture. Um, but again, me as a young boy, I've got to respect, you know, retrospectively respect, <laughs> um, that yeah, I had to come off for a tactical reason. After after the high of helicopter Sunday, not not everybody involved in Oslo, all the fans, all, all the staff, and especially uh, the manager and the players, was it difficult for you to then leave the club? And why did you why did you make the move that you did? I also had a couple of uh, teams down in down in England. Was that the key natural move for you? Was it a move you wanted to make, or did you feel kind of forced into it at that time? Um, it was it was the time uh, Hutton was starting to break through, um, and and he clearly uh, showed potential. Um, and you know what? I was exhausted. I was, 
I was beat, I was gubbed because to to be five years in the first team at Rangers with such a strong squad, 25 internationalists, just to constantly play three games out for six, play two games out for four, play one game out for three, and constantly need to fight and fight and fight just to stay afloat. It was it was really, really tiresome. Um, you never want to leave Rangers, of course not, but when the manager tells you you're not going to be featuring and there's a young lad coming through that they're, they're going to invest their time in, you've got to, kind of, you've got to respect it. So, yeah, it, it's hard leaving Rangers, but when I did leave Rangers, I didn't realise how much pressure I was under because when I ended up going in and spending at time at Wolves, um, Sheffield Wednesday was a, a disaster um, from, from start to finish. I, I was the biggest mistake in my career. Um, I think I was badly placed by an agent there playing for zero money, <laughs> oh, oh, mess, total mess. Anyway, I ended up at Wolves and I was able to walk about Wolverhampton as a Wolves player playing the championship and have nobody talk about football, nobody come up to me for an autograph, nobody, nothing. It was just so relaxed and, and you don't realise how much a pressure cooker. And people say Glasgow, it's not Glasgow, it's the whole of Scotland. You go anywhere in Scotland, anywhere abroad, you still get noticed when you're a Rangers player. So it's... Even though you know, there'll be fans here saying, how's it pressure being a fit Rangers player? You know, I'll give me that chance any day. And yeah, they're right when you look at it in, in, in that scenario. But when you're used to that's your life, that's your day-to-day -day scrutiny, you know, constantly scrutinised. And, and one half love you, the other half hate you. You don't know who's who, you're walking about. You're constantly on eggshells. You know, if I went into a restaurant, I would always have my back to the wall. I would never face outwards in a restaurant because you never know what happens you know somebody can take a dislike to you anything can happen so you're, you're constantly on on edge um and but you know it's it's that edge that makes it so addictive it's that br that brilliant feeling of pressure demands it's, it's 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 a weird it's like an addiction um and it wasn't until i went to wolves i realized oof that's that's a stressful situation to be in, but one that I would still want and still one that you'd still crave it as a as a football guy that you want every week. When you then eventually make the move out to Norway and sign for Viking, does that give you that same that same buzz? Do you get that same adrenaline rush out there, or, or is that very different in terms of both on and off the field? Is that a very different life and experience once again? <laughs> then it went full circle where I would get annoyed at people for appearing like they they were happy with drawing at home and. They were happy if we played well, but we lost one nothing. I'm like, this is just, this is alien to me. Um, and it took me a few months to, I never ever quite got there, but I did have to temper my expectations um, in that environment. Um, but me and the manager, again, had a tempestuous relationship with Rosa, who was a, a phenomenal footballer, a German footballer played in Man City, etc., who's went on to a great coaching career. He's, he's, he's a cracking coach as well. But me and him were too similar. Too similar, and we used to crack heads all the time. And ultimately, there's only one winner there. So I was only there two years, and then moved on to Turkey, Tur Turkish Super League. And then, yeah, and on to China and whatnot. So, no, it's, 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 a, strange, it's a strange journey, but one that I've, I've learned much, you know, by, by taking... Um, but there's, there's nothing, nothing ever, ever, ever compares to, to, to being three o'clock running doing that tunnel at Ibrox. That's, that's, that's the pinnacle of, of, of football for me. So you do have, as you mentioned, your, your time in Turkey, you then come back and go to Aberdeen, you then go to China, you come back, you go to Motherwell, it's better Livingston. Uh, if, if we look at the, uh, the China move, what, now what was the attraction there? And now when you moved out there, it's obviously 10 years or so ago now, did you get the feeling that China was going to attempt to become the kind of major player that it has looked to be in world football? And you see the, the money and some of the guys that managed to attract over there in the last couple of years. Was there any sense that China was on the brink of trying to become a major player in football? Or would, was it still one of the like a lower league, like a lower standard uh, when you first made the move out there? Um, again, and it's one I'm not, I'm not proud of, but... The, I went there for for a financial injection um, because I had lost a bit of money in and and uh, financial breakdown in two thousand eight. Um, so I was trying to recover some kind of you know, financial security, um, and and I still maintain to the day leaving Aberdeen. 
at that point who offered me uh, a long contract to, to stay there was the biggest football mistake I've, I've done. Um, I could have been at a, a good, I mean, Aberdeen's another great club, um, I must admit. You know, I thought that being a Rangers man from Dundee, going to Aberdeen, it would be, it would be hard for me, but they, they, were, they, were, they were a nice uh, bunch of people in Aberdeen. Uh, the, the football club was great, you know, a nice family club. Um, but to go to China, ah, ah, that was tough. Technically, technically brilliant. Football understanding, horrific. Um, like so far, so far removed from what you've been taught from from ten year old uh, at Dundee United's and Rangers and whatnot. It was like, oh no, this is a, this. I'm in the wrong movie here. I'm in the wrong movie because my whole game is based upon moving in sync with my teammates in relation to the goal, my opponent, and the ball. And I'm so I would make a movement expecting to turn round and my teammate adjacent to me would make a corresponding movement and it was like, could you not see you have to move in there? And that was always via an uh, interpreter. Oh, it was tough. Tough, tough, tough. I mean, I remember I got called to the manager's room before one of my first games to discuss uh, something and I could see these tapes from UEFA. So they've been buying tapes how to defend in a 4 4 to how to attack in wide areas, 4-4-2. Four, four, I'm like, these guys are learning this off a, a video. You know, I'm like, this is, this is, this is odd for me. And again, with my, with my character, you know, in, in, China, in, China, in Chinese culture, for you to show emotion, it's, it's not welcomed. You've got to have, have a more demure, more safe face. You can't shout at anybody because they then lose face and it becomes a problem. But, in, in Scotland, if you can tell somebody with an aggressive face on, you know, that was effing brilliant, great ball, keep going. But you've got an aggressive tone because you're in a football stadium. But because they don't understand what you're saying, your, 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 your gesticulations, your, you know, your, your movements, your hands look aggressive. So there was just a miscommunication everywhere and ultimately it ended up me leaving there quite quick. Ten months I was gone again. Through all your kind of foreign since, Morris, how, how did you find life off the partner? Did you have... Okay, friends that you were able to make in, in the various places? Did you have your family go out with you? Or was it a fairly kind of lonesome and at times quite a, like a difficult existence in some of these places? In Turkey and China were difficult for me because we were constantly in camps. So you never got to see any friends or family or on the outside life. You were constantly in a camp, driven away somewhere. Or, or, in, the, or, or in Turkey, it was, you, were, you were in a certain town, but it was basically guarded by... Uh, armed guards so you know there was sometimes I just I just couldn't handle it so I would sneak out I would get my missus to drive in um, at the time drive in uh, I would put a big Cachilli sport jacket on in the back seat and sneak out for two or three hours or stay the night and then come back early in the morning when they, when they were you know just, just to get out of the place because it was you're surrounded by I don't know, 30 people that speak Turkish and maybe one or two English-speaking people. So it's really lonely. It, it is lonely. Like, Norway was a different story. Norway was a brilliant culture, uh, a good social culture, uh, out on the boats, you know, going for barbecues on the boat. And just, it was a great, great, great country in Norway. Um, so that, that was easier. That was more like the UK. Um, but no, listen, there's tough times, but how can you, how can you go and... and, and, and go to China and expect it to be easy. You've got to, you've got to expect that it's going to be different from what you're used to. But it, I think it makes you more tolerant of, of other cultures. It makes you more tolerant of people. Um, um, I, I think it certainly, when I, went to, when I went to Norway, I certainly grew as a person and I think I became a better person. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm glad from experiences, good and bad. Because as much as you talk about, well, you can take the ask coach the good stuff, it's also about recognising what terrible stuff that some coaches do, and you say, oh, I'm not doing that. So you still learn, even from a negative situation, if you've got that mindset to learn. Um, I think that's important. You've got to want to learn. You've got to want to identify what's good and bad and what makes it good and what makes it bad. And then putting it into your own thought process and, and delivering it what's, what's true to your heart and, and, and how you deliver a session or how you deliver a coaching point. It's got to be, it's got to be you. It can't be somebody else. You try to be somebody else, you've got a short, short, short lifespan. You've got to be yourself and you can steal other people's ideas, but ultimately you've got to go into your thought process and you've got to regurgitate it and deliver it and what's, what's true to you. Morris, just on that, when you talk about 
um, coaches you worked under and things like that. Um, do you have a, a, a certain coach who you would take the most from tactically um, and, and now adapt it for yourself? Was there anyone that stands out from your time in the game? I've, I've been documented saying it as well. Jan Vauters is undoubtedly the one that changed my mind on how to think. Because you know, it's, it's, it's actually a skill on training your mind how to think. It's not just about watching, oh, that was a good session, copy the session. It's the thought process, it's the, it's, the, it's the detail, it's everything, it's the distances between players, opponents. Where's the ball? Where's the goal? If all these things that you need to comprehend at computer speed, it's about training your mind to think that way, that what Jan Vauters brought me. <coughs> um, that obviously now that after 2011, I said I was going to go into the coaching side, that you then start monitoring what's right, what's good, what's interesting. And who's doing it? I mean, the, the obvious one is, is everybody talks about it as Guardiola. That, that's, he, I think he was the, the one that <coughs> kind of turned my head to, to start monitoring what he was doing and reading about it. But again, you, he then starts talking about that his influences have been Marco Bielsa. And then, you know, and, and Pep also talks about uh, the, the boy Roger Schmidt, who was, he, he, Roger Schmidt, uh, I, I think he's German. I think, yeah, I think he's German, and he was, uh, uh, was at Barcelona or, or Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich played uh, Red Bull Salzburg <clears throat> in a pre-season game, and Salzburg battered them. So rather than going in the huff and whatnot, Pep asked to pick his brains, and he ended up going back to his house for a few hours, and Schmidt told him about his pressing style and what was the triggers were and how they did it and how they trained it. Because everybody wants to do this whole gag and pressing thing now and sprint about and sprint and run and that. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody can run and sprint in any direction, but it's about the triggers, it's the, it's the moments, it's the distances. Is the distance too big to press? Then don't press. Distance too small, you know, you can go at a, small, a lower intensity. The angle of the press, all these different things is about understanding when and how to implement it. The next thing is, how do you train a football team like Liverpool to run for 95 minutes in the right direction at the right time plus having the, the, the coolness of character to take a touch and, and play when it's on to play and this is what I'm more interested in but sometimes you kind of get the access to these training sessions because it's, it's so critical to what they're doing and if everybody knew it then everybody would do it so it's about recognising what I like but it's also recognised how can I get there with this level of player I've got and it's about diluting what the top boys are doing like your pets like your Roger Smith and diluting it to what works for Motherwell because we can and on a 4-3-3 for Pep he wants his wingers two, two wingers high and wide and he's two eights in the wee pockets either side of them but at Motherwell as fantastic as your boys are they don't have the the ability to keep the ball the way Barcelona players or Man City players do so we've then got to adapt and say, okay, we can't hover wingers high and wide like that. So we need to look at another pattern of play or another permutation that allows us to still get forward and still get crossing the box, etc., but with less risk. And that's where the beauty is because everybody wants to play like Man City, but they don't have the players. It's about getting that fine balance to knowing what you've got, how far you can stretch them, and how do you train them to then have that impact on a Saturday. I mean, they, they, that was the one that Roger Schmidt touched on. He, he said that, so normally in, in Scotland and in, in every, every, every club across the country will play 4v4 games or 5v5 games with 40 by 40 or 50 by 50 yards. And typically you'll play the games between, from anywhere between two minutes and four minutes. Now when Roger Smith went into uh, Red Bull Salzburg, he said, we play these games for one minute and every single thing you do, you have to sprint. You cannot stop sprinting in they, they, that one minute. And all the players laughed at him. They thought it was ridiculous. They hated it. Now, that goes from how can Red Bull Salzburg press Bayern Munich and beat them 3 nothing? That was the question that Pep asked. How can you train these boys? And that was one of his key ingredients was training the players like that. One minute of sprinting. But of course, there's so many sets. There's so many repetitions to, to get to that level. But that was his thought process. And that's what, for me, I find intriguing and where I want to find more and, and you know, 
and hopefully I can get access to 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 bigger clubs and, and see how the, the real real top boys are doing it because it can it can only benefit myself it can only benefit my life. That's an interesting thing you talk about Morris um, in terms of that it was one of the things I was going to have ask you there's been a move um, away from kind of Barcelona's possession football to a more German style high intensity pressing game over the last couple of years do you think we'll see another shift sometime soon in which we'll have to adapt to and, and do you see a kind of formation and style that that possibly is heading towards? <clears throat> if you, if you, in a simple world, we talk about formations, right? So you would say that Liverpool play a four-three-three, okay, or a four-two-three-one, whatever you what you want it, whatever way you look at it, four-two-three-one typically. Now, when Liverpool are attacking a team. Where does the centre backs typically? They're ten yards in the opponent's half, so that shape ends up being ultimately like a two-three-five because they need to spread the, the, their forwards across the width of the pitch to you know end up putting having an impact on an opponent that they, they need to play six at the back. So if they play six at the back, your two-three formation that can, controls the game is, is enough because you're, you're playing five against four then if they've got six at the back. Now, the beauty in that is when do you release everybody up into the higher parts of the pitch to get five up there? Because you can't just run up there because if you lose the ball, the team counter, and then they have the numerical advantage. So it's the beauty of knowing when to move into areas and sustaining attacks because people take bad touches, opponent gets it, but it's the next wave of attack that's important. So people talk about ah oh, defending deep or attacking. They're inextricably inextricably linked in my opinion you cannot attack and you cannot defend in isolation you've got to do both at the same time you've got to build you've got to attack with a with a thought and the, and the foresight to know we might lose this ball here how are we going to sustain that attack how are we going to mitigate against a counter attack and that's the beauty and like i'm saying it's not just a case of we play 4-3-3 we play 4-3-3 at motherwell but in some scenarios in the game we'll play we'll have uh, a two, three, five formation. So it, it's it's about ebbing and flowing. It's not just okay. Now we attack. Now we defend. So I mean, listen against Rangers and Celtic, it's more black and white. However, when I mean, we're going toe to toe against teams like Aberdeen, Hibs, and Hearts, you know, we know what we want, and it's about triggers. It's about recognition, and it's about repetition of pattern for us to give your players the best chance of containing football matching, controlling what's controllable and giving us the best chance of, of, of scoring goals and, and, and keeping the goals at the other end. So it's, it's intricate, it's not black and white. It takes time, it takes much know-how, and it takes humility from the players, which is what we have in spades at Motherwell. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great wee club to be in, and, and you know, the players that we deal with day to day are, are magnificent in terms of their attitude and their, their, uh, and their willingness to learn and, and, and implement what we're trying to do. Or well, it's finally the last um, couple of questions. One of them I had to want to ask you: um, Has there ever been a game where you've been involved in where a major tactical surprise has, has caught the opposition off guard? Um, you know, something that's that nobody's expected, or or even something that you've done during your your kind of management style, and and you've actually you can see the game plan just unfolding exactly how you wanted it, and the opposition have no idea. I think one one that was basically fabricated was we we went to Celtic Park, and Celtic were playing four uh, three five two at the time, and the manager told us, what was it he said? Yeah, he said line up. I think he said line up in a three five two, which would then make us mirror Celtic. So if you think about three five two three five two, that's three straight three defenders against. Larson and Hartson, for instance. So there's, there's, that, that's normal. So we're basically matching up. So he said, make sure you stand in a rigid 3-5-2 before the game so that Celtic and, and Martin O'Neill can see, OK, it's like for like. Now, if we went like for like against Celtic, they would beat us up in a 3-5-2 match, like for like. So we set up like that. And then we flipped to a 4-3-3. And I think, I think it was... La I think it was... Lovenkranz and or no, it was Kinchelskis and Lovenkranz or Kinchelskis and McCann that went st stood wide right and wide left. Do you think about it on a back three? Celtic then need to bring their two wing backs back 
to cope with the two wingers or they go back to a flat four. So what we were effectively doing is we were, we were making our opponent change to suit us, which means they've worked all week on 3-5-2 and their they wingers are going to be high and this and that and that and then bang, we've, we've forced Celtic into a change. And I think the game ended up 3-3, it was, it was a thriller. Um, but it, it was one of these games I thought, wow, that, that was quite clever for, for the manager, that was Art McLeish. Um, I think one that <laughs> I had one in the Faroe Islands when I was a manager. Now I had fit boys and they were just like robots. And we played away one time and we got we were they, the team got two penalties right in the first half. We got two men sent off in the first half. Now I'm I'm absolutely fuming because in the Faroe Islands it's so small that this referee right at the time was from that village that we were playing in and he was married on to the manager of this team's sister and I hear all this so my head's absolutely burst right and I'm thinking I, f I felt so I felt at the time you know of course it wasn't but I felt cheated two nothing down nine I'm down to nine men what do I do do I just say ah oh, that's it or I said no I would rather get beat six nothing than try it so half time I said to the players and I, I was with their permission I said do you trust in this? I said, we need this. You're going to be knackered. You're going to be done. You're going to, you're going to lose chances against them. They might score more, but this is a, the best chance we've got. And I put them in a 3-2-3 three, three formation. I think a 3-2-3, three, three, it was mental. You know, I, I don't know if I would do it at the top level because it maybe be scrutinised beyond belief, but it worked to me end up getting scored in the last minute. It was a 2-2 two, two draw. But, you know, that was probably the most daunting thing or the most crazy thing I've done in, in terms of tactical switches because it's, the easy thing is to go into a a four three two or a, a sorry a four a four four or a four two one or whatever you want to whatever way you want to do it you know and, and be defensive but I thought you know nah I'm I'm going to go for it I'd rather lose six nothing than than than, than go down with, with a kind of fight um so that was probably the most most interesting one I've got um, for you I know it's a fair Islands, it's not maybe exciting for the the average Rangers fan to listen to but aye that was it you also um when you were first um starting off out in Norway, I read this morning that you took, um, you managed to persuade the boys to train four times a week and you ended up taking them through several divisions and and, you, and this is how you caught the bug. What is What can you tell us about that? And, and finally, before we, we let you go, you've been really generous with your time, but before we let you go, what's your kind of future plans and, and where do you see Morris Ross in a couple of years? I'll answer you first. <laughs> the, the, the first. The first thing I thought, if I could play at the top level, by being disciplined, run, fit, energy giver, then anybody could. That was my thought, right? So I said, okay, so I've, I took over a team that had just been relegated to the fourth division and I had four players and I signed for this club with four players. Now, the good thing about that is I had, the, I had four months to get players in, build a squad, build a system, etc. And and I just asked questions. I asked open questions all the time. Do you guys think twice is enough? Some would say no. Some would say yeah. I said okay. And I took the decision. I said we're going to train four times a week plus the match. So that's so bit bit. And what I was I was selling them a story. I said you're a Man United fan. You're a Liverpool fan. You know you're a Newcastle fan. I said we are now going to do the same training hours as the Premier League. So you're selling them a story. So they think oh that that might be what's that's pretty cool. And they bought into it straight away. Now, of course, I was making mistakes at the time. You know, I was making them train two hours instead of you know, 70 minutes of active training. Or well, nowadays, it's 50, 55 minutes of active training. But, you know, I was making my mistakes. But you make them believe. And you put an honesty into it. And everything had a, a bit like bomber. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you step out of the line, there's a punishment. You know, and these boys were playing for free. But if you believe in a cause and you believe in, a, in, in what you're trying to do for the benefit of the group and there's no, there's no cutting corners on anyone, you know, we, we started introducing analysis. You know, we were getting, a, a, you know, the club had no money, but I had to pay, pay a guy from the budget to, I say the budget, was honest, it was peanuts, to, to, to video the games, you know. And it, I mean, we're talking video a game, you know, there's people's heads in the way and everything like that. But we did what was... We did. We, we took what was for free, and we harnessed it, and we worked our, our, our for want of a better word, our nuts off. 
and to get double promotion and finish fifth in the second division, which is the, the club's highest position ever. And what, what gave me belief was when I moved on from that club after three years of service, they brought in a Premier League, to be league manager, uh, a guy who'd coached in the top league in Norway three years previous, and they got relegated. So I'm thinking, okay, so what we did was we finished fifth with certain values, certain things that we did. And, 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 and at the time, a, a supposed better coach than, than me was relegated with that group. So, uh, you know, that gave me a bit of confidence. And it's okay, okay. So I just need to tweak certain things and become a better coach and still have that curious nature that's, that's taken me to, to where I got to. Um, and what, what, was your, what was your final question, sorry? Just to... I was just to ask you um, where you saw yourself and what you've learned from your, your kind of coaching so far and, and where you're going to be in a couple of years' time. I am of the belief that football chooses you, you don't choose it. So as, as, as hard as I work, as good as I try to be or am or whatever, it doesn't matter. The game has got to choose me. So right now what I can control is what I give Motherwell back, what I give Stevie Robinson and, and the coaching staff. And right now that's my sole purpose is to give them every out of every inch of, of, of uh, every ounce of energy that energy that I have, amount of tactical knowledge I have, um, be a good employee and be loyal to, to what Motherwell and, and what the, the manager want. Um, everybody wants to coach at the top level. That's 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 normal. But not everything you want in life you get. So what I do is I try to, to, to be as diligent and, and as, as curious as I can to, to make myself better all the time. I believe I'm a better coach than I was last year and next year I'll be a better coach again. And it's about how much I apply myself and, and how much I network, etc. that um, I believe I'll, I will get there in the end. Um, but right now, I've got a loyalty to Motherwell and, and Stevie Robinson um, to give them every, and everything that I've got. And... I'm in no rush. When I first started as a coach, I wanted to take over the world, as, as everybody does. But there's, the, there's an evolution. You know, people look at me, I'm still a 39-year-old man. So in their head, ah, he's a young guy, but I've still been coaching for eight years. So it's many training hours, it's many matches, it's many, many scenarios that I've now got in my database that, that I can now recall on the, the, the touch of the button, if, so to speak. So it's, it's about having humility, it's about having patience, which... I'm not really known for both of them. Um, so it's, it's about having control of my thoughts and, and winding my neck in now and again. Just take your time. The game will come to me. Um, if I'm, I'm, if I'm you know, doing what I'm doing now, behaving properly and, and, and try to perfect my, my trade. Um, but right now, I've got a, I've got a loyalty to Steve Robinson and, and Motherwell. Well, it's final one. Um, and, and just joining back. Um, to your time at Rangers, something we, we like to ask everybody, we've, we've asked all our podcasts is, what's your favourite memory of, of Rangers? Um, and a final one just to end our podcast with you. The obvious one is, is winning your trophies. I would have to say the transition, and it's no one memory, the transition from going from being a decent under-18 player to the under-20s reserve captain to being sitting next to Barry Ferguson and Neil McCann and looking at Ronald Abur and Andrew Kinchowskis every day. That whole transition from being a wee boy to being told you're never going to play Rangers. You know how many players play Rangers? And there's only one every five years plays and da 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 and hearing that and hearing um, <clears throat> all these detractors or whatever you want to call them um, trying to tell me what I was good enough and what I wasn't good enough when they didn't have a clue. Um, to make it, to, to finally come through and, and be a kind of, kind, a kind of beacon for the, the, the new Murray Park era, you know, it's somebody that made it through, John Brown, proud that I made it for John Brown, who spent so many hours educating me, crucifying me, cajoling me, cuddling me, all that stuff, all the, and, you know, all the people that were, John Chalmers who brought me through, who, who, who's fortunately, unfortunately not with us anymore. All these people that have that have helped you, and when I mean help, I mean, you know, people say oh, you'll never do it. They help. They help because I thought oh, I'll show you. I'll show you all these emotions, all these hurdles, all these, all the, all these, all these tiny, tiny parts of your makeup that that that, that end up 
coming coming out and then when you make that debut, when you then win that first cup final, it's it's special. And it's not for the faint hearted and this is where I hope Rangers can get the fine balance for having a safe environment in Murray Park to having a realistic environment that you need to put hurdles in front of boys, not make it as plain sailing as possible because I think the more hurdles they put in front of these young, talented Rangers footballers, when I say Rangers footballers, Rangers youngsters, then you've got a chance of becoming a Rangers footballer and pull up to, to Ibrox in your, your nice car with your 150 games and your trophies, etc. And you're not a Rangers player until you win trophies, in my opinion. Might be harsh, might be a wee bit black and white, but that's how I see it. That's how I've been brought up. That's how the generation before me were brought up. And it's about time that we get back to these values of winning as everything. Nothing else matters. So a huge thank you to Morris Ross um, for joining us. Morris was obviously part of treble and double winning squads. And um, he's he very, um, I thought, Chris, that he was very um, humble. He, I think he, he doesn't, rate himself as much as, as we the support do. Um, obviously his cup final performance and, and things have kind of brought him back into the, the limelight after it um, was showed a couple of weeks ago, but certainly a brilliant guest and a great insight. Oh, I see. He's got some really good stories about his, his playing days and also some great insight from his, his playing days, but really interesting to hear his, his take on the game in general. And I think if you know, we look at what he's done as a, as a coach and a manager so far, He's also really committed to Muddle and, and the job that him and uh, Stephen Robinson and Keith Lasley are doing there. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, Morris Ross as a, as a manager in Scotland or in England over the next uh, couple of years. He seems to have a really good uh, vision for the game, knows what he wants, knows how to get the best out of people. Um, and it's a really, really good uh, insight and a really good chat with him. Yeah, definitely. Next time I get a couple sent off in football manager, I'm definitely trying the 3 2 3 formation. That sounds like a good one. But on that note, um, Again, it's just another great guest. We've got um, some more lined up and then we'll be going back to our, our monthly podcast, um, which we bring you. So it's a, a huge thank you again to Chris Jack for joining us. Chris, thanks for your time. No problem at all. Anytime. So it's a huge thank you to our sponsor, KGM Printing Services, and they're on Twitter at KGM Printing. They do 3D printing by order. They do all the, the team badges for coasters and pictures on the wall anything ranging from AC Milan to, to, to our own Rangers and they're also doing some four lad stuff so go and check them out they're at KGM Printing and also to um, the, kit, the Custom Kitchen Factory guys um, Ali Dick and the crew there they all look after us and make sure we, we sound good and also a huge thanks to Stuart Franklin at Jersey um, for editing get yourself on the, the Jersey website and come join us in all the discussion and also their weekly flagship show on a Sunday night. You can find us there. So on behalf of myself and Chris Jack, this has been the Four Lads the Dream podcast. Ignore the nonsense, irrelevant and the noise. Loyalty to Rangers is what binds us. And together we are stronger. Launching for the 2021 season, the MyJers membership programme is a new way to get even closer to the club you love. It's the one place where you can access benefits like ticketing priority, club discounts, and exclusive competitions and experiences. There's even a limited edition welcome gift when you join. Visit rangers.co.uk slash myjers to join today. Always Rangers. Always loyal. Always rewarded.